uh, we uh, welcome uh, today case presentation and first we will start with the pediatrics in prayer by dr kabal subramaniam treasurer iaptns good evening one and all we'll start today's uh, program with the uh, pediatrics prayer kulandai maruthuni nirangidal engalukku mulumiyaga gunamalikkum thirnai tharum noyirin thunbandikkum thiran namakku valangapatta eppadi patta sirappirumai enbadu panivudam nam unaruvumaga ella kulandigalukkum avargal kudumbathinarukkum அவர்கள் சமுதாய படி நிலை மற்றும் சாதி மருத்துவ பிரிவுகளை பாராமல் நலம் தற்றல் ஈகை அன்பு அமைதி ஆகியவற்றின் தூதர்களாக என்றும் இருப்போமாக நம்மால் முடிந்தவற்றை மாற்றவும் நல்லவற்றை உள்வாங்கவும் மாற்ற முடியாதவற்றை காரணத்தில் ஏற்றுக் கொள்ளவும் போதுமான மெய்யறிவும் பொருதலும் எங்களுக்கு வழங்குக உங்களது வாழ்த்துக்களையும் அருளையும் கருணையும் எல்லா சூழல்களிலும் நேரங்களிலும் அனைத்து மக்களிடையே கொடுத்து அருளுங்கள் நன்றி காலேஜ் Uh, first i welcome our uh, uh, chairperson of the today presentation uh, dr p selvakumar he is a professor of uh, uh, pediatrics and uh, head of the department at uh, tanjore medical college and he is a renowned uh, so faculty as well as a teacher also i welcome dr selvakumar i uh, welcome uh, today's moderator thank you sir uh, dr prasant uh, he is a uh, associate professor of um, pediatric neurologist at means uh, uh, aims all the institute of medical science he is having uh, almost uh, 80 international publications and 24 uh, uh, chapters uh, he has written uh, various uh, textbooks also uh, and he is a um, renowned uh, uh, faculty in uh, aims and i welcome uh, dr prasant i think he is definitely enrich our knowledge I welcome dr prasant thank you sir thank you yeah i welcome our um, my colleague uh, dr mullai balaji he is uh, done uh, dm uh, at pj chandigarh he is having many laurels in his uh, cv and he is uh, published many articles and he is a faculty international renowned uh, faculty also and i welcome dr mullai balaji he is currently is a consultant sir, uh, pediatric intern swiss at uh, kobe medical center and hospital and he has published uh, uh uh three articles with autoimmune and capillaries also i welcome dr mullai thank you sir thank you i uh, welcome uh, today's uh, uh, post graduates from tanjore medical college dr sri shruti badrinath as so today's uh, presenter and uh, dr sri balaji dr rogni they are from uh, tanjore medical college tanjore i welcome uh, all the post graduates i welcome today's uh, judges dr Uh, balasankar from madurai dr s uh, lilar c chennai dr janendra sankar chennai and dr p ramachandra sir from srmc dr s sinivasan from uh, chikmar pandicherry i welcome one and all and it's uh, now it's over to dr uh, selva kumar and uh, for brief introduction we will start the presentation sir so, like uh... Good evening, sir. I would like to thank uh, on uh, behalf of the Department of Pediatrics, Tanjore Medical College, and on behalf of the postgraduates for giving us the opportunity to present the opportunity to present uh, this evening. Uh, this uh, DA, uh, the presentation PG presentation was started way back in uh, on twenty uh, sixth of uh, September, if I am right, in two thousand twenty. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the corona wave it is really 11 weeks carried over and it was uh, because of the effort taken by rajendra uh, and uh, dr tarumurgan sarani under the able guidance of dr ismail and uh, the previous uh, president dr sendal and other office bearers like gopal subramaniam uh, it was uh, like uh, it is a it is something like which is being continued like for nearly 11 months like and it has always start punctually and the the discussions have enriched my knowledge as well as the, uh, my post graduates knowledge like and uh, what motivates me is like uh, the presence of uh, senior pediatricians like uh, dr srinivasan sir dr ramachandran sir dr janani shankar madam and dr balashankar and uh, like uh, dr kungavela sir like who add uh, like uh, their valuable uh, wisdom to the presentation like thank you sir for the opportunity again Yeah, uh, now I welcome Dr. Prasad. Yeah, a few words will start. Yeah, Dr. Prasad. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity, sir. It is great to be there, there between uh, among the stalwarts of pediatrics in that part of the country, and um, 
I hope that we'll have a good discussion and it is a very good thing that the by people as graduates are coming up with neurology related topics and these are very relevant. So I am very hopeful that we'll come up with some very good discussion and I'll be happy to contribute. And thank you for this invite. Thank you. Thank you, Prasad. Dr. Mullai Balaji. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, sir, for the uh, uh, wonderful opportunity. As mentioned, like uh, it's again a knowledge sharing. Uh, a, a senior uh, teachers of teachers are all there, so we'll also be uh, enlightened by their uh, knowledge and wisdom. And I hope the session uh, uh, some interesting discussion goes on. Thank you so much, sir, and uh, we'll be eager to learn from these topics. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mullai. Now I uh, invite uh, Dr. Sri Suruti Patinath to uh, start presentation. Uh, Nifaya, 11 year old girl, one of the twins born of third degree concern. Dr. Suruti, I think you are keeping two devices at a time. I think so getting um, not very clear. Then, so, yeah. like, okay, you are having a two devices. One, uh, one device, you please switch off. Yeah. Also, I request Dr. Shri Balaji to uh, mute them himself. Okay, yes, done. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, start. Yeah. Sir, is it clear now, sir? Yeah, clear, clear, please. Hello. I, uh, I have to keep the I mic nearby. Voice is very low. Speak louder, Shruti. Yes, sir. Nifaya, 11 year old girl, one of the twins born of third degree consanguineous marriage, was uh, who was apparently normal before 33 days, was bought by her mother, whose reliability is fair, with complaints of convulsions, two episodes, one on the day one of illness and the other on the day 33 of illness, involuntary movements for 32 days, and behavioral changes for 17 days. History of presenting illness. The child was apparently normal before 33 days. On day one of illness, around 3 p.m., while she was playing with the mobile, she developed deviation of angle of mouth to the left and drooling of saliva and uprolling of eyeballs that lasted for 10 minutes. And the child regained consciousness in 10 minutes. The parents took her to a pediatrician nearby who examined the child and reassured the parents that the child was normal and asked to review if such episodes recur. On the same day, at around 11 p.m., while sleeping, the parents found her to have tawny posturing of all four limbs with uprolling of eyeballs that lasted 10 minutes. She, was, she regained consciousness en route to hospital and was started on anticonvulsant syrup by the same pediatrician over phone. On day two of illness, the child started developing abnormal involuntary movements of both the hands, more on the left side, that was not voluntarily suppressible and persisted throughout the day and absent during sleep. The sensorium was preserved during the involuntary movements. On a review in day four, the same pediatrician examined the child and considering the episode as an abnormal, ab ab abnormal behavior, stopped the anticonvulsants and prescribed sedatives for 10 days. While on sedatives from day five to day 15 of illness, the involuntary movements persisted and the child had increased appetite. After 10 days, the drugs ran out and the child started developing behavioral changes. She started looking around aimlessly, responded poorly to commands by the parents. The duration of her sleep reduced. She made only incomprehensible sounds. She didn't ask for feeds and when fed, she didn't swallow them completely and uh, she had weight loss. Gradually, the child became totally bowel and bladder incontinent. The abnormal movements also progressed to involve all four limbs, both the forearms, arms, both the legs, predominantly involving the left side. And the child also had bizarre movements in the form of grimacing, chewing movements of the mouth with intermittent protrusion of the tongue. The child also had intermittent episodes of stiffening and she maintained the limb in the postures the child was made to adapt by the parents. The parents also noticed abnormality while the child was walking. The gait was clumsy. On day 23 of illness, the child started behaving violently. She started beating the parents. So on day 24, 
the child was taken to a neurologist the neurologist prescribed antipsychotics the parents could not take up the diagnosis and took the child to a known psychiatrist who advised carbamazepine and clonazepam the parents gave the prescribed drugs to the child and kept her in darga for 9 days while in darga the violent behavior subsided but the involuntary movements persisted during the entire course of illness the child was ambulant able to lift the arms overhead get up from sitting position able to turn from one side of the bed to other and she responded to pain sensation by withdrawing the limb on the day of admission the child had one episode of gtcs at around 5 pm she was taken to a private hospital treated with some iv injections and was referred to our center this was the video of the child upon presentation The video is not playing, doctor. Sir, it's playing, sir. Uh, it's playing. It's playing. It's playing. You can see and hear. Nifaya, 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 Nifaya. the child had no history suggestive of any cranial nerve involvement there was no stiff flailless nerve no wait balance. wait doctor like we we'll, doctor doctor please yes, please sir. hold on like we'll have some discussion regarding the history please hold yes, on sir. doctor yes sir we'll stop here for discussion like okay like uh, here like in your presentation you make a mention of one is it go to the history like one it's a seizure sir nothing is audible sir it's not audible hello kumar is uh, hello hello kumar you are muted i think unmute ah uh, ah so, uh, totally is like there are yeah. you are telling about uh, like one as like uh, regarding convulsions and other is like uh, uh, regarding involuntary movements like uh, can you tell me like how do you differentiate uh, convulsions from uh, movement uh, involuntary movements like uh, sir uh, in this child uh, the involuntary movement is uh, more random uh, it was varying in uh, rate and uh, direction 
and also the uh, duration uh, seizure would have been brief here the involuntary movements persisted throughout the day and uh, also it was uh, flowing in nature uh, typical of choreoid movements choreoid movements rapid uh, random appearing sequence of chaotic continuous uh, dance like movements that appears to be flowing from one part of the body to another so uh, it uh, there is a clear demarcation also the during the first uh, episode the sensorium was uh, lost and uh, while the child had involuntary movements the sensorium was preserved initially So the two uh, like characteristic feature which uh, differentiate uh, your movement disorder from uh, seizures are your randomness and the flowing quality. In movement yes. disorder, it's uh, like uh, it's a non-patterned with a variable speed, timing, and direction, flowing from one body part to another. And uh, the flowing uh, flowing nature and randomness uh, differentiates uh, your seizure from involuntary your movement disorder. Yes, okay, why do you say it's choreoid? Um, yes, sir. Uh, because uh, again, uh, it is random, chaotic dance-like movements involving proximal parts, along with the uh, slow riding movements of the fingers. So it is probably choreoid the time movements, sir. Okay, like uh, why not like uh, these uh, movements like our uh, um, pseudo seizures? Why are saying like uh, they are pseudo seizures uh, uh, will uh, will also disappear in sleep. Uh, seizures can appear in sleep. The during uh, pseudo seizures, how, how are they different from seizures, right, sir? Um, pseudo seizures will have a trigger, emotional uh, trigger. And uh, during the ictal uh, phase, there can be eye closure. It will be associated with autonomic uh, disturbances like uh, bowel and bladder incontinence. Uh, then um, uh, after the episode, uh, uh, it can uh, the child may be able to demonstrate it when asked to. And also, uh, it will uh, the seizures will be short lasting, and uh, pseudo seizures will may be prolonged and. Uh, that is how we differentiate seizures from pseudo seizures, sir. Shruti, sir is asking that why it is not a pseudo seizure. So you need to differentiate an involuntary movement from a pseudo seizure. Um, Can you make out any secondary gain for which the child was doing this? No, sir. Uh, no. Uh, so, so, no. so that is one important thing that would be there in children who they is, it is a functional disorder no so they would yes. have a secondary gain for which they want to do all these things and again they would they would be a pattern where it will happen it will also be there in a pattern in a crescendo decrescendo manner because the child would have very a large amount of energy to begin with so there would be large amplitude movements and gradually when the child gets exhausted it will slow down then again when he gains some more energy he'll again do that so that pattern was it there available in this no, so you sir. don't see all these things. So probably sir was asking about this. So you need to differentiate between these two and the near continuity of these movements possibly is a suggestive of more of a extra pyramidal, a movement disorder. Yes, uh, sir, sir, may I, I, I do have a few questions on this movement. If this is, uh, may I proceed, sir? Yeah please, yeah, please proceed. Yeah, please. So, so Shruti, uh, just before we go ahead with this, I just had one thing to tell you that whenever we present a case in pediatrics and it has got a slightly prolonged history, we should always comment that the child is developmentally normal. So the word is actually a typically developing child. So normal, it becomes very vague, you know, and uh, he, was, he didn't have any symptoms. This also becomes very vague. So the typical word that we use is a typically developing child who was apparently asymptomatic. Whether or not she was normal or not, we cannot say. We can just say that the child was apparently asymptomatic before these complaints started. So that is how generally we begin when we discuss a child, especially when we are talking about a neurological case. And here, 
again the movements there was one important thing that you have not talked about it is quite asymmetric isn't it yes sir so maybe the video is showing like this or all you must have made a video must have observed her no so was it always that the left side is getting affected uh, all four limbs the involuntary movements were there sir but uh, the amplitude was more on the left side sir okay okay so possibly but there was a definite asymmetry that i could identify now whenever you are presenting a history of a movement disorder and then there is a seizure also happening it will always create a confusion in the examiner's mind so what sir has asked you all these things that you said about chorea it should have been there in your history so what you should have characterized the movement disorder that you saw what you spoke was right but then it should have been reflected in you so that one can imagine what is you are talking about so a clinical case presentation is such that the examiner who has not seen a case can examine in front of him ki what actually was happening in when you actually saw the child so all those things should have been there in this description so this flinging dance like non stereotypic movement with proximal and distal extremity getting affected and some asymmetry with some you rightly notice that there were some finger movements were also happening so it is possibly a choreoathetosis that is happening but it is asymmetry can i make a comment uh, dr prashant jagri if you don't mind yes, definitely sir yeah please uh, because she is uh, really giving history and uh, she will have to tell what the mother says mother will not be able to describe all this in details probably in the examination she will be telling describing what you wanted the to tell that's what i feel because you know we are supposed to tell only what the mother say but uh, as you are correct extremely very valid she can uh, try to probe and then find out but uh, anyhow she will be describing you know when she tells clinical findings about the abnormal movements probably she will bring in all the details sure sir sure sir that is also a uh, one way and the, uh, the crux is that that it should come out wherever it is Yeah. You have said, uh, doctor, like you have said, bizarre movements in the form of grimacing, chewing, motion in the mouth, but intermittent protrusion of the tongue. Like, what does it suggest, sir? Uh, uh, orofacial dyskinesia, sir. Those were um, because uh, they are involuntary, uh, repetitive. Uh, bizarre movements involving the muscles of the face and uh, lips probably uh, orofacial dyskinesia sir okay uh you you have mentioned like uh, there are intermittent episodes of stiffening and uh, the child maintain the posture uh, the limp posture which uh, the parents uh, like uh, the child adopted the posture with the uh, Uh, child like uh, for example it was like the hands or uh, whatever it is like uh, it adopted the posture uh, maintained the limp posture which the parents like uh, when they move the limbs like they adopted a particular posture like so what 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 do you want to like uh, tell by that uh, um, sentence the stiffening me uh, is uh, suggest of catalepsy and maintaining the limbs and postures the child was made to adapt is suggest of uh, waxy flexibility the um, episode the uh, must be catatonia sir you say catatonia like other than waxy flexibility like what are the other features which must be present um sir uh, the child should have a mute may, may have mutism posturing um a negativism uh, catalepsy uh, waxy flexibility uh, negative uh, negativism automatic obedience then uh, uh, echolalia um, then uh, behavioral disturbance uh, mutism uh, stupor at, at least three of the features should be present to grade it to catatonia sir Equilalia and uh, mutism both will no, not go hand in hand. 
One thing you missed was a post gripping is there in most of these things. If you have your cototonia, you might also have a post gripping. All the others you have actually enumerated. This was the only thing that was missing. Okay, good. You have said in the involuntary movements, they were not suppressible. Okay, what are the involuntary yes. movements which are suppressible? Sir, uh, ticks can be suppressed, sir. Stereotypic movements can be suppressed. Um, ticks and stereotypic movements. Then you have said, like you have made a mention regarding like uh, these query form movements are absent in uh, like, uh, these movements, involuntary movements are uh, suppressed or absent during sleep. Like what does it suggest? Uh, during sleep, most of the involuntary movements will uh, be absent only, sir. Uh, be it psychogenic or uh, pathologic, uh, the involuntary movements will be absent during sleep. Uh, the um, few involuntary movements that are present in sleep are uh, uh, balismus, then uh, uh, benign torticollis of infancy, facial myokymia, and uh, only those things are uh, present during sleep. Then uh, benign sleep myoclonus is also present during sleep, sir. You said uh, there is uh, abnormality while walking, isn't it? Yes, sir. Why? Sir, uh, in chorea, the child can have a clumsy gait. So just because the child uh, has chorea involving the lower limbs, the gait could have been clumsy, sir. Sir, Dr. Prashant, any further questions, doctor? Thank you, sir. So, uh, Shruti, uh, why you, what do you specifically mean when you are saying that there was a specifically bladder and bowel incontinence that is there? So are you trying to identify there is some other uh, problems specifically you are, or it is part and parcel of the encephalopathy that was there? Uh, it is uh, part of the encephalopathy, sir. Um, the child has behavioral disturbances cortical uh, disturbance, so the frontal lobe involvement causes uh, uninhibited bladder, so there, there is a uh, ball and bladder incontinence, sir. So it is, is a part of the encephalopathy that you are specific, you, are, you want to highlight? Yes. Okay, okay. So, uh, Acha, tell me ki what, when do we actually use this word, uh, clumsy for walking? What does this word clumsiness suggest? This is actually used for a specific form of gait, you know, Clumsy, clumsiness or wobbliness, I would say. Uh, so it is uh, inability to perform an accurate and smooth coordinated uh, gait. Um, so what is that? It's also seen in cerebellar involvement also, we can have... So it is, this, the word is primarily used for cerebellar ataxia, you know. So what must have been happening here is that because of the significant flowing dance-like movements, it might have been difficult for the child to actually ambulate. So you know there is an entity called Puria Paralytica. Yes, the Puria becomes so significant that ambulation is not possible. So possibly by the time the child came to you, this was the reason why there was no, no uh, ability to walk or the gait you could not have assessed in your examination. Okay, um, uh, we can we can proceed further. Doctor Mullai. Uh, ah, yes, sir. Any questions? Yeah. No. Um, uh, I mean, just a few comments. Uh, you have described nicely the involuntary movements. Uh, just few things that uh, again need to be mentioned in the history are any precipitating factor or. How you you just so said that they disappeared during sleep, but whether the involuntary movements, uh, uh, certain movements like the intentional ones, or when we are uh, uh, trying to reach an object, if the uh, amplitude increases, then it can point towards a specific uh, uh, cerebellar uh, uh, etiology for the involuntary movements or not. So possibly you can uh, involuntary movements you can further describe like 
how it began whether any diurnal or no, uh, nocturnal variation it told okay. but any specific uh, uh, specific thing that aggravated the movement or any specific thing that uh, decreased the intensity of these movements so that will again complete the entire description probably we had a video which gave a more better understanding but uh, uh, when we present the case we don't have videos then whatever you say it should be like uh, a complete uh, in toto of whatever the parents have recognized themselves i think yeah we can proceed for this there was no history suggest to of any cranial nerve involvement uh, like drooping of eyelids dryness of watering of eyes nasal regurgitation of hoarseness of voice there was no history of flailness of limbs there was no history of excessive sweating there was no history of fever no history of ear discharge no history of recent vaccination no history of drug intake or toxin exposure no history of skin rash joint pain or joint swelling no history of headache blurring of vision giddiness or vomiting no history of cold or heat intolerance no history of diarrhea or constipation no history of puffiness of face there was no history of decline in scholastic performance or intellectual ability prior to the onset of illness there was no history of head trauma there was no history of abdominal pain past history Ruti, there was like, no uh, please history. hold on Shri, uh, Shruti, Shruti, yes, can sir. you go back to the previous slide? Can you just uh, tell tell me like why you have asked all those histories? Like? Um, fever to rule out any infectious causes of encephalopathy, um, to herpes simplex, uh, measles, mumps, and all that. History of ear discharge again to rule out uh, CSOM and back source of infection. Uh, no history of recent vaccination, post vaccinal demyelination. And all that to rule out that sir. No history of drug intake or toxin exposure. Uh, certain uh, uh, toxins like lead, the uh, mercury, methyl alcohol, molybdenum can uh, uh, cause scoria. Uh, few drugs are uh, notorious to cause these uh, involuntary movements. Uh, then uh, there is like uh, in Korea. Um, uh anti psychotic uh, anti parkinsonism medication medications can worsen the chorea and uh, dopamine inhibitors upon withdrawal can worsen the chorea then uh, 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 psychomimetics like uh, amphetamines methylphenidate can worsen the chorea calcium channel blockers like uh, sinarizin flunarizin verapamil can worsen the chorea and uh, also lithium beclofen there are uh, in number of drugs that can cause chorea Uh, and, and toxin exposure we discussed. No stiff skin rash, joint pain, and any uh, anti-convulsants, doctor. Any anti-convulsants can uh, cause chorea. Yes, sir. Uh, valproate, carbamazepine, and phenytoin can cause chorea, sir. Then uh, no stiff skin rash, joint pain, or joint swelling to rule out PSLE uh, that can have uh, neuropsychiatric manifestations. um there was no stiff headache blurring of vision giddiness and vomiting to rule out uh, space occupying lesions in the brain um then uh, no stiff heat or cold intolerance diarrhea constipation puffiness of face to rule out thyroid uh, cause for uh, the encephalopathy um there was no stiff decline in scholastic performance and intellectual ability to uh, rule out wilson's and uh, ssp that usually have uh, initial manifestation of decrease in scholastic performance sir um no history of head trauma to uh, explain the poor uh, encephalopathy and abdominal pain uh, to rule out uh, porphyria uh, or uh, any torsion of ovarian teratoma uh, most likely uh, for rotamen in encephalitic causes sir Doctor Prashant, sir. Oh, she has. She has. She was able to explain. This was one question that I was also going to ask, sir. I just, just for uh, for the knowledge of our MDs. Okay, so the purpose, you know, why we take a negative history is to. So the first thing we want is to we want to localize the problem on the neuroaxis. 
So sometimes we would like to ask ki what the parts of the neuro axis which are not affected. And then the other part, part, reason why we take a negative history is to get to the various etiologies, to exclude as many etiologies as possible. So, so one needs to be reminded she has taken, she had covered almost everything as an MD. It was a very good uh, negative history, I would say. Uh, we can proceed, sir. Past history, there was no history of similar episodes or hospitalization in the past. There was no history of exanthematous fever, no history of sore throat, no history of jaundice, no, no history of blood transfusions. Why did you ask for a history of exanthematous fever, Dr. Uh, exanthematous sir, fever, why did you ask? Again, uh, measles, mumps, rubella are associated with encephalopathy. Uh, when, uh, and uh, herpes can also have vesicles uh, which can present with encephalopathy. Uh, but you are asking this in the past history, no? That means you yes, want sir. to rule out a past history of an yes, example uh, if a child developed the measles uh, before two years of age the child could develop uh, at around 10 years ssp so history of exanthematous fever uh, comes into play and uh, herpes simplex virus uh, can uh, recur with uh, uh, autoimmune encephalitis uh, so a history of exanthematous fever is uh, So, uh, Shruti, these, these, are, these are... Okay. Sir, you proceed. Sir, like, uh, please, please continue, sir. Uh, uh, Shruti, so these are two different things, you know. So, if you are asking in the past history, then the reason is that you want to rule out SSP and you wanted to rule out a past history of measles. If I, uh, if you had to ask about herpes, you could have said that in the recent, recent past, on the recent few days or few months, was there any history of an exanthematous illness which has recovered and now there is again a neuropsychiatric disorder that has come up. You want to see whether there is a saddle back pattern or there is a period of normalcy and then again there is a disease that has flared up. That will give you a possibility of an autoimmune disease. Yes, sir. Regarding the other histories, no history of sore throat, jaundice, and history of blood transmission. Like, uh, what are the necessity of asking them? Uh, sore throat to rule out uh, panda, sir. Pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders. Then uh, sore throat can uh, also lead to sedanam scoria. So, uh, the for that, sir. Jaundice to rule out Wilson's. Uh, history of blood transfusions uh, to see uh, the source of HIV and kephalopathy and all so. Dr. Mullai? Ah, yes, sir. Yeah, the she was able to answer all these, sir. I think then proceed. Continue, Shruti. Birth history, full-term LSCS, birth weight 2 kg, no history of NICU admission, Developmental history, uh, scholastic performance was fair even before the onset of illness. Immunization history, immunized up to age according to national immunization schedule. She was last vaccinated at 10 years of age. No history of recent vaccination. Diet history, according to 24-hour recall method, pre-illness history was taken and there was a calorie deficit of 500 kilocalories and protein deficit of 5 grams. Family history, no history of uh, similar complaints in the family. No history of uh, epilepsy or tuberculosis. The other twin is normal. No history of contact with any open case of tuberculosis or COVID-19. Socioeconomic status, according to modified Kukusami scale, uh, belongs to grade four, upper lower class. Summary. Nifaya, 11 year old, developmentally normal child whose scholastic performance was fair Bought with complaints of seizures, involuntary movements of all four limbs, and behavioral changes with sleep and speech disturbances, loss of bowel and bladder control for 33 days duration with no significant past history or family history. Uh, I would like to consider this as a case of subacute encephalopathy 
and offer the differentials. Okay, Shruti, 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 get back to the previous slide. Yes, sir. Achha. Uh, before we go to the etiology, Shruti, do you want to take a history of past history of any cardiac disease in this child? Yes, sir. Uh, maybe RHD uh, could have uh, caused uh, pseudonym scoria. Then uh, uh, tetralogy of phallet uh, brain abscess can develop, and uh, but that will be associated with focal neurological deficit. So it's not about brain abscess, but it is about a possibility of a syndenum scoria. It is a subacute onset scoria primarily, no? Yes, sir. So, so you would want to know whether in the past there was any cardiac. So what history you would take if you have to rule out? RHD, sir. You, yes, you want to rule out a cardiac disease in the past and now there is a possibility of a rheumatic scoria, say. So I want to consider that as a possibility. Uh, arthritis history could have uh, it is an early manifestation but generally you know not that arthritis and chorea both doesn't occur don't uh, occur together together okay so, so and anyway you need to take the past history of that so what are the things you are going to ask so arthritis should you have tell you have asked about joint pain and all because of sle but that could have also given you some history of arthritis what will you ask for ruling out a cardiac illness in the past? Uh, history of any uh, uh, recurrent injections, uh, every three weeks injections for any drugs or any drugs, routine no, drugs. What if, what if it always it stayed undetected? We don't know. Uh, the child could have been... Uh, of uh, tired all the time, uh, fatigability, uh, breathlessness, um, palpitation, maybe. So, yes, so palpitation, easy fatigability yeah. should you can have asked, or there is some sort of a dyspnea which is happening. So, yes. these things could have suggested, and then weight loss or failure to thrive like status this would kind of have suggested as some sort of a chronic cardiac disease which could have been there so uh, shruti when we are uh, at times when we discuss a neurological case how we proceed is that ki we try to identify from the history the summary we try to develop a syndromic diagnosis that you have developed so you are keeping a syndromic diagnosis of an extra-acute encephalopathy the syndrome, I don't mean Down syndrome or something, or genetic syndrome. By syndrome, I mean the, a conglomerate of the clinical sign and symptoms to which you can label it just like, say, acute flaccid paralysis is a clinical syndrome. So then after that, we try to localize the problem on the neuroaxis to whatever possible ability we have of the information that is coming from the history. Then we talk about the pathology that could have led to the involvement of those areas and the clinical syndrome that you are thinking about. And as a fourth step, we would come to the etiology. So this way, what happens, you know, as an MD, it also decreases your conflict with the examiner. If you'll come straight away to the etiology and say you want to keep one over the other as your differential, your examiner might not agree. So if you break your egg, uh, your uh, diagnosis into four steps, talking about that, okay, this is a subacute encephalopathy. Almost all of us would agree. So 25% of your work is done. Then you would come up on the possible localization on the neuroaxis. And if you are able to explain based on your history, you, you will gain confidence from the examiner. And then you discuss what are the possible pathologies which possibly you have done in the next slide that you showed. But this is the way you should be discussing. But this is one suggestion. We can do that in this way. Sure, sir. Sir, because uh, there is sleep and speech disturbance, uh, cortex is probably involved. And uh, there are involuntary movements. Uh, basal ganglion is also involved. So uh, we are probably looking for a cause that involves the cortex and basal ganglia. Very um, good. So the differential diagnosis, um, subacute encephalopathy, uh, it can be immune mediated, infectious, metabolic, vasculitic, neurodegenerative, or space occupying lesion. 
immune mediated uh, autoimmune encephalitis acute disseminated encephalomyelitis pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with streptococcus uh, sreet uh, steroid responsive uh, encephalopathy associated with autoimmune thyroiditis infectious causes herpes simplex virus encephalitis tb meningitis varicella hiv uh, wilson's for metabolic cause sle by vasculitis neurodegenerative mechanisms like uh, ssp subacute sclerosing panencephalitis or space occupying lesion okay so this is your differential you want to keep uh, you have a you have a big list but okay so the first pathology you want to consider in this child as an immune mediated process agreed yes. and under that you want to keep autoimmune encephalitis why don't you want to keep rheumatic heart disease ya yeah, rheumatic chorea sorry as a possibility sir uh, in rheumatic chorea the sensorium will be preserved uh, the cognition will not be uh, lost so okay. uh, other features of rhd are not met uh, so it uh, does not explain the seizures as well sir uh, chorea uh, sedanam chorea does not explain the seizures and encephalopathy only the involuntary okay, so, movements are explained okay to agreed you. agreed so can so can you give us before we all discuss out ki what should be the three or four top differentials can you give us the pros and cons about all these differentials that you have kept Uh, autoimmune encephalitis is a diagnosis of exclusion so uh, i would like to discuss that at the end uh, then uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis the it is the most common demyelinating disorder so associated with encephalopathy so that is a uh, point in favor of uh, the points against are there will be sensory disturbance motor disturbance optic neuritis and papillary edema ataxia uh, so all that are absent in our child so these are the points against uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and it's also common in the age group of 5 to 8 years most common boys and also uh, follows uh, post infectious or post vaccinal course so this child didn't have any history of uh, fever or uh, vaccination history so those points are against adem um and it is also acute and onset uh, within 2 to 3 weeks the manifestations would have developed the then uh, pandas uh, the criteria for pandas is uh, uh, it should have a temporal association with streptococcal infection uh, our child didn't have a history of streptococcal infection it uh, it occurs in children less than 3 years of age most commonly um it will be acute and onset often associated with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and uh, tics will be associated our child uh, didn't have tics and also there will be the cognition will be preserved in pandas uh, then uh, is a sweet steroid responsive encephalopathy associated with uh, autoimmune thyroid shruti wait so uh, just for the discussion sake and for all of us so you know you you rightly mentioned the differentiating points for adem one thing i would also want to add is that you think of adem when you have a multifocal affection yes sir so this sorry. word you can you can use as a present in presentation that i have to have a multifocal presentation what here we are seeing is a gradually a graded disease you know first uh, some seizure some gradual behavioral issues then encephalopathy then seizures but different sites like the spinal cord or the optic nerves they are not getting affected and there was no nothing that could suggest that initial trigger was also not there so these two points would be most important now pandas you know actually now we, do, we use pans as the word pans yes, pediatric acute neuropsychiatric disorder. acute onset neuropsychiatrism very good so in pans you know all these things can actually happen it's not that you only takes and ocd will be there but what the differentiating feature for pans is that they would always be in a relapsing remitting manner you know even without treatment they would be rapidly they would be sign and symptoms then they might decline with therapy or without therapy again there would be sign and symptoms and the cognition would be preserved so significant behavior and movement disorder waxing and waning with a baseline cognition preserved 
you think of pans, you may or may not have a sore throat. It can be a subclinical infection. We might not get it in our children. So it, in that scenario, we think of pans. And then there would be additional investigation which will help you rule out that. Okay. Yes, now the third, fourth one. Um, steroid responsive encephalopathy associated with autoimmune and thyroiditis. The points in favor are uh, even without the symptoms of uh, uh, hyper or hypothyroidism, the child can have a uh, uh, sweet. And the points against are, uh, uh, I would like to suggest it's rarity. Only one case has been reported so far, uh, that 20, 13 year, 14 years old child. So uh, the infectious causes, next. No, 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 uh, no, it is something more is there in that. See, see. so these, these are good to enumerate when you are writing an answer, but when you are there on bedside, so just something is very common and something is less common will not help you in talking about that index case. In that case, it becomes very difficult. Ki, okay, only 60% of cases are reported vis-a-vis 30% with some other disease. So we will not consider one or you will consider one over the other. What happens is that ki, the point positive was that there was a subacute onset in kephalopathy with movement disorder. That can happen with acute thyroiditis or TPU associated and Hashimoto's thyroiditis or street, whatever you want to call that. But generally, most of them, they have myoclonus happening or there would be some other additional behavioral components which was not there. Thirdly, encephalopathy would be there more prominent. Here, what happened in encephalopathy was late to set in, isn't it? Yes, sir. So generally, we see that encephalopathy was there with movement disorder. Here, as per your history, after your behavior, after your seizures and some extra pyramidal movements, then the encephalopathy was there. Yes, sir. But then this is not a very strong difference. This can you need to rule out on your investigation. So it would be actually considered as a part of your autoimmune encephalitis. Yes, sir. Sir, also stroke-like episodes will be seen in street tremors will be associated. Uh, can be, can be there. So, but it is, it is actually why we all are learning about all these autoimmune disorders. You know, the spectrum is evolving. So it is better that don't, don't uh, try to actually disengage it from the autoimmune encephalitis word. So it can be considered as a part of that. Sure, if you sure. have so many differential, it might at this level it will be difficult to actually differentiate these out one over the other. Don't in autoimmune, don't talk a we street separately. You can and within that entity you can talk about it. Okay. Yes, uh infectious causes, uh herpes simplex virus encephalitis. It can explain the encephalopathy, it can explain the seizures. And it can is explain the involuntary movements. Uh, post HSV autoimmune encephalitis could explain the involuntary movements. The points against are uh, there is no history of fever in our case, and uh, the child also and uh, the seizures will usually be unilateral uh, in uh, herpes simplex virus uh, infection, and it will be associated with uncinate fits, associated with auditory or gustatory hallucinations uh, that could not be picked up in our child. Uh, so, in so, so can we have other residents also answering? So, uh, who are the other students there? Ah, uh, yes, Balaji. So, what do you think? How will uh, can herpes in kephalitis present like this? This is a Usually, very cute. So you would want to keep it as a strong differential or not? It, it can it can it can be a differential, sir. But usually it is acute acute onset in nature, sir. Post uh, HSV encephalitis, but um, post HSV encephalitis encephalitis can occur sir, as a subacute encephalopathy. So, so you people want to say that you are considering a post HSV autoimmune encephalitis as a differential. So that will again be an autoimmune encephalitis with HSV as a trigger or herpes encephalitis as a possibility. What is there in your mind? 
probably a post hsv or what i mean in kepletus okay so post hsv you don't have any history to suggest that there was an illness then there was a period of normalcy and then again there was a worsening did you had that you had any febrile illness with some subtle cns issues or something you didn't have the day the child had seizure and then there was movement disorders that started at that very point of time which gradually evolved into encephalopathy so you don't have this saddle back pattern to suggest that there was a trigger and then there was an process had it been there then the possibility of an autoimmune encephalitis was very high then you don't need other differentials but here her post herpes autoimmune encephalitis can be definitely a possibility still but then this will again come in autoimmune encephalitis but there is another way herpes presents so that was what i wanted to ask you so there is a sub acute herpes encephalitis which presents as a neuropsychiatric disorder so this can be a sub acute onset herpes encephalitis yes the proportion is quite less but you have a short history of 4 to 6 weeks like an autoimmune disorder then a sub acute herpes encephalitis is also a possibility and if you say that focal seizures were not there then the first slide that you showed the first seizure there was actually lateralization towards the left the eyes got deviated the eyes and face got deviated towards the left so that could suggest that there was a left focal seizure and the rest of the seizures the onset was not witnessed you know you said that it was sleeping then the mother noticed she also must have been sleeping when she put on the light she saw that the child was already in generalized tonic status so by that time maybe a focal seizure got generalized so whenever we are discussing a seizure we need to ask who was the eye witness and did she this saw the onset or not if onset was not there then don't be very sure about that it was dtcs one say ki possibly the when the parents or the eye witness noticed there was a generalized tonic clonic movement but the onset was not clear so this you should keep this in your mind when you are keeping your differential it might not change your differentials here but it will give you more clarity on your discussion okay next next differential so tb meningitis sir it okay. could explain the seizures encephalopathy and the involuntary movements uh, the points against are uh, usually uh, the most common involuntary movements is tremors and uh, usually seizure will be a late manifestation in tb meningitis <coughs> here the seizure was the first uh, thing and uh, tb meningitis will be associated with uh, focal deficits and uh, ocular involvement in the form of uh, ophthalmoplegia our child uh, didn't have all that there was no history of contact with any tb and also uh, the bc bcg is uh, vaccinated appropriate to age so okay so why seizures happen late in tb meningitis because of the development of tuberculoma uh, so any child with tb meningitis with seizures has to have a tuberculoma it's not it's uh why does seizure happen in meningitis because of inflammation of the meninges so seizures originate from meninges shruti no sir cortex so what has to be involved to cause seizure cortex has to be involved sir meningo encephalitis so encephalitis. that is the answer so in meningitis a seizure will not happen till it has complicated so whenever you have early onset seizure in meningitis it is possibly because of a some systemic problem this electrolytemia hypoglycemia some shock related encephalopathy these would be possibilities and may, most of them would cause a cause a generalized seizure if the seizure is happening late then it suggests that something has happened in the cortex because of that bacterial or tubercular meningitis it can be infarct it can be some cerebritis it can be an abscess anything but something or hydrocephalus for that matter which is compression so this is why this is the reason i wanted to actually use this opportunity to discuss okay what next 
um, varicella varicella could explain the encephalopathy and the seizures the points against are uh, the child didn't have fever uh, didn't have any rash though the encephalitis uh, can occur even before the onset of rash classically between 2 to 6 days after the onset of rash we have uh, uh, neurological involvement and also it resolves within 3 days uh, but the child had history for 33 days and it is it will be usually associated with the uh, ataxia um, acute cerebellar ataxia our child didn't have all that so I, our child had a lot of cons and they were very less of pros you know so what we see in very very cellular either we see a stroke or we see a cerebellar cerebellitis like picture so an infratentorial encephalitis a brain stem encephalitis like picture might be there or cerebellitis acute cerebellar ataxia would be the presentation so i would not keep very cellular here as a differential and in a setting where there was no evidence of any exanthematous fever so then it was not a differential that should be kept Yes, HIV. HIV could explain the encephalopathy, sir. But uh, seizures are very less common. Uh, they can occur uh, if there is any concurrent sinus lymphoma. Or, uh, in utero, the child could have developed uh, toxoplasmosis. And uh, once the CD counts falls below 100, the child could manifest with seizures. The, then the encephalopathy will typically be intermittent. Uh, there will be periods of deterioration and uh, plateaus. Uh, also, the criteria for HIV encephalopathy uh, suggests uh, more than two months duration of uh, the symptoms. Uh, there will be a, a failure to attain new milestones or regression of the previously attained milestones. Then uh, there will be a, a acquired microcephaly can be there upon serial head circumference monitoring or MRI. Okay, okay. So so in the interest of time, we'll cut it short, but you will not talk of a microcephaly in an 11-year-old child, no. So already the head uh, circumference mm -hmm. that was to be achieved is already yes. there. Here, whenever you have an acute onset neuroregression, neuro regression, you should always keep HIV encephalopathy as a differential. And yes. then you rule out by asking histories that suggest that there can be a possible um, uh, possibility of HIV or not like recurrent diarrhea, recurrent infections, blood transfusions, as you have asked. So, but yes. these are the reasons why you would always keep a HIV-associated neuroregression or encephalopathy as a differential. So, yes. uh, maybe, maybe I have I grilled you a lot. Maybe Selva sir or uh, Balaji, you can you can proceed from here. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, Dr. Balaji, uh, is it possible for you to modify this whenever a child presents with this 32, 33 days of history? Uh, can you just modify this summary? Can you add on to this, whatever she has written? What are the important things uh, you need to know whenever a child presents with a subacute case? If it is progressive. Yeah, progressive. Yeah, progressive. Yeah, progressive in nature. Okay, very good. So, yeah, proceed. Doctor, there is a mention like uh, by the judges, like uh, whether like TBM can exist uh, like without fever in a immunocompetent uh, competent uh, child. TBM can present uh, without fever like. Uh, that is like uh, has been raised by the judges. And uh, one more point is like you. You said regarding brain abscess, can it uh, uh, like you can, can you say a brain abscess like without fever? These uh, two sir, points. Are... Uh, okay, sir. Sir, uh, may I answer, sir, to these questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, TBM, TBM at times in my experience, sometimes we see that fever may not be a very significant problem. So a mild grade fever with that TBM can happen. But you will never get a brain abscess, a bacterial brain abscess without fever. So abscess anywhere in the body is going to cause moderate to high grade fever and it is also going to be sustained for some time. So in this setting, in this history, with this history, I will not keep a brain abscess as a differential. If at all an ixol has to be kept, then it has to be something else. It cannot be a brain abscess here. 
but tbm yes it can but this child has significant two months almost one and a half month history without any signs of meningismus without any signs of raised intracranial pressure so these things keep tbm a very less likely a possibility here but then just because of the epidemiology that can be considered as one differential this is my take sir that's all it is all uh, also being mentioned by the judges that uh, like you have missed out on the like co uh, course course of the illness during hospital stay has not been you have not uh, mentioned that okay uh, comes later so has been uh, okay then, then go to the next slide doctor in that like uh, how did you like uh, you have uh, like highlighted certain uh, diagnosis that is like one is face occupying lesion and sd can you briefly tell you tell like what are the possibility like uh, why you consider that as a differential like sle is commonly associated with chorea and this is a female child uh, then uh, the S in sle this neuropsychiatric manifestations uh, can occur even before the onset of uh, the rashes so those are the positive uh, points the points against are uh, uh, the other criteria of sle at least four of the 17 criteria should be met that is not happening here so sle is uh, ruled out space occupying lesions uh, the neurological manifestations in korea uh, in neurological manifestation in sle they mentioned only two uh, like important uh, like features as in that what are they psychosis and seizures sir. Why? Why did you consider space occupying lesion? Like, what are the pros and cons? Uh, sir, supratentorial space occupying lesions usually present with uh, when they involve the frontal lobe, they can present with personality changes. And uh, while they and this child also had increased appetite, uh, that can can be a part of diencephalic syndrome. That is a characteristic of supratentorial tumors. Um, and uh, the points against are uh, they there would have been a focal neurological deficit that is absent in a child so the points are against space occupying lesion and also if uh, the if sir. the supratentorial uh, yes sir doctor like uh, ramchandran sir is asking like why it is not a neuro wilson sir uh, in wilson's the intelligence will be preserved uh, the cognition will be preserved uh, whereas uh, here uh, there was uh, cognitive uh, decline and also seizures are not explained by wilson's uh, course, then uh, the uh, the course will be different first there will be dysarthria followed by dystonia and last only choreoarticular movements and see will occur sir Shruti, I would, Shruti, I, I would, I would defer. I would go with Sir rather that Neuro Wilson would be a strong possibility here. You know, keep uh, the common ones that you see is there in dystonia, but before that, there can be other movement disorders that can be there, and with so much of behavioral issues and extrapyramidal movement, maybe your interpretation of cognition is wrong. Okay. so you at this point of time you will not be able to rule out neuro wilson there are enough points to consider it as a strong possibility points against would be that there is no history of any hepatic affection till now that would be one point that you can talk of and if it was an acute wilson there is no history of an acute hemolytic crisis or hemolytic anemia there so those can be one a few points that are against wilson but that would be would stay as a strong possibility here yes. can you think of a new uh, uh, i just wanted to make a small yes 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 dr bala go ahead yeah sorry uh, i just wanted to make a small comment uh, you talked about sle and you are saying like the uh, four criteria have not been met and again in sle what you need to know is it's again a disease of evolution so the point of time when you see the child is different and how the uh, other organ systems are going to get evolved so they are all different so uh, just with the based upon the history alone uh, you cannot say that categorically are ruled out 
uh, especially in a girl child neuropsychiatric manifestations that sl is completely ruled out obviously you need to have more uh, examination findings and maybe at least ba- some baseline investigations which we can uh, come to later but uh, you cannot categorically rule it out uh, and again the point of neuro wilson uh, dr prashant sir had mentioned so these are all some of the common uh, uh, childhood illnesses which uh, which are a close differential for a, a child with acute onset of neuropsychiatric behavior so uh, this will be strong content as we cannot just rule it out based upon just history sure sir what history will suggest uh, that uh, these coriform movements can be due to iem doctor in one error uh, error of metabolism like uh, what uh, any history like will suggest sir uh, there will be uh, worsening with uh, fasting or feeding uh, change after uh, uh, change in course after uh, the fever or uh, um, it will have a it would have had a chronic course from uh, since birth the mother could have noticed vomiting failure to thrive and all that also involvement of multiple okay, organs and, uh, one organ system will be involved Uh, so these would be characteristically seen when you have an early onset neurometabolic disorder what if there is a late onset neurometabolic disorder so these are these are these there are pathway cycles you know for all the most of them so if there is a late a defect which is late in the pathway you can have a presentation which is a sub acute and late in nature yes sir um, glutaric aciduria can present at this age sir after taking us with Uh, no no glutaric acid urea which present with hydro with mag, with macrocephaly you know and then the yes. presentation would be early so macrocephaly with extra pyramidal features in 1 to 2 year of age that is where you will consider glutaric acid urea leshnigan's uh, auto acute intermittent porphyria in even in my experience we have seen children with sub acute autoimmune encephalitis like presentation or i would should say that a sub acute encephalopathy with neuropsychiatric manifestation with or without uh, extra pyramidal involvement here you should think of late onset neurometabolic disorders such as methyl malonic acidemia or you can simply say organic acidemia so if you go and see the literature you will find that they are one close differential or mimickers of autoimmune encephalitis yes sir so if we also have one uh, leaks leaks is a very sinister form of a metabolic disease so if you have onset then generally there is death in the initial phase in the late onset once you will have a lot of brain stem and extra pyramidal infections also so mitochondrial is always a differential and in mitochondrial leaks can be one so if you are thinking of a neurometabolic disorder then you will have a small molecule neurometabolic disorder then organic acidemia mitochondrial cytopathy should be the word rather than saying leaks because this is not the classical age at which it occurs these two can be considered homocysteinemia can be there as a possibility they can have asymmetric extra pyramidal movements like hemichoria or hemibelismus and then behavioral issues but generally they will have some morphinoid habitus which was not evident in your child but these three again would be a differential so if you if someone asked ki what should be the differentials of a subacute onset neuropsychiatric manifestation in a child uh, at this age or maybe at 5 to 6 years of age so all these things would be there an immune mediated process of autoimmune encephalitis sle is as dr balaji said that it is you cannot rule it out it, it is a very valid comment that he has made sle wilson and in the initial 4 to 5 weeks even ssp can have some behavioral issues to begin with and only after that you can have myoclonus appearing so that is also a differential and then sub acute viral encephalitis and you have some metabolic disorders that i already discussed out so these would be the differentials if you have ruled this out and there is some coarseness if there is a coarse facial profile with some delay is there then you can think of an mps type 
they also just present with behavioral manifestations. So these are the differentials that one should have in your mind. And sometimes arrested hydrocephalus can have behavioral issues, but you will have some reason to develop that hydrocephalus, which was not there in your child. So we are not keeping that as a differential. We can proceed, I think. Can we go? Uh, we, can we go to the examination, sir? Uh, yes, yes sir. Uh, Rohini, sir. Rohini, continue. On general examination, child lying on the bed, awake, spontaneously looking around and not recognizing the parents. Child was afebrile. There was no paler, no ictus, cyanosis, no clubbing and no lymphadenopathy, no neurocutaneous markers, no peri peripheral nerve thickening, there was no trophic ulcers and bed sores. Anthropometry, weight was less than 10 centiles and height was between 15th and, uh, 25th and 50th centiles. BMI was less than 3rd centiles. Head surface 53 centimeters, normal. Vital examination, temperature 98.73 Fahrenheit in right axilla, pulse rate 86 beats per minute, pulses normal volume, regular rhythm, all pulses equally felt in all four limbs, respiratory rate 20 breaths per minute, thoracic type and uh, no distress, blood pressure was 90 bar 60 millimeter mercury in left upper limb in supine position, SpO2 was 98% uh, in room air. Head to toe examination, hair normal, face no facial dysmorphism or asymmetry, uh, eyes no cataract, no ptosis, nystagmus, no squint or no cave ring, uh, ear, nose, throat examination was found to be normal, uh, skin no neurocutaneous markers, BCG scar present, oral cavity no caries and no ulcers, chest and abdomen normal, thyroid gland normal. There is an involuntary choreothetoid movement of all four limbs, predominantly left with uh, orofacial dyskinesia. Uh, SMR uh, staging stage was uh, two. CNS examination, higher mental function, uh, appearance and behavior. Child was awake, uh, spontaneously looking around, no facial expression, not obeying commands and not oriented to time, place, and person. Speech and language makes inappropriate, inappropriate sounds only. Memory could not be assessed. Higher cognition could not be assessed. Sleep pattern was altered. Cranial nerve examination. First nerve could not be assessed. Second, third, fourth, and sixth nerve. Voluntary eye movements present. There is no movements uh, to command. Uh, field of vision and color vision not elicitable. Direct and co consensual light reflex. Bilateral pupils equally reacting to light. 3 mm normal in size, shape, and position. Menace reflex present. Fundus examination was appears to be normal. There was no ptosis or squint. Uh, fifth nerve sensation over uh, face. There is a pain, pain sensation present. Uh, masseter and jaw movements present. Jaw jet absent. Seventh nerve, there is no facial asymmetry, uh, angle of mouth comes to be normal, no uh, loss of nasolabial fold. Eighth nerve, uh, strenuous and webusters uh, could not be elicited. Ninth and tenth nerve, palatal movements uh, equal on both sides, uvula in midline, pharyngeal and uh, palatal reflexes present. Eleventh nerve, uh, uh, stenogloda mastite and trapezius uh, could not be elicited. Twelfth nerve, tongue. A bulk and tone appears to be normal. There is a protrusion of tongue present. Uh, Rohini, uh, you have made a mention of uh, menus reflex uh, under 346. Okay, what is menus reflex? So, uh, it, is a, uh, it is a reflex uh, on visual threat. There is a closure of eye, eyeballs, eye, eyelids on visual threats. Yeah, eye blink. What are the, what are the nerves involved? So optic nerve for vision. Uh, optic nerve uh, for vision. 
and afferent for and for efferent there is a seventh notation for closure of eyes okay, you, have, you have made a mention under 346 okay it is 2 and 7 okay proceed doc continue doc motor system there was no obvious muscle wasting bulk was normal in all four limbs tone uh, uh, in all four all four limbs there was increased tone and was increased in uh, all uh, gravity and anti gravity muscles there is rigidity type of uh, increased tone is present dr rohini like you said uh, like uh, this is a coriform moment isn't it like in the yes, uh, second arm scoria like how is the tone hypotonia will be there sir hypotonia will be there in second arm scoria or you can make a you can uh, like a, say like a, there is variable tone when there is coriform movements but then you have said the, the tone is increased like how do you account for that sir uh, when uh, only when caudate is involved there will be hypotonia when other parts of the basal ganglia are involved uh, there can be varied tone can be varied sir nigral nigral striatal fibers gets involved means there will be increased tone in the substantia nigra involvement leads to increased tone pruti what sir is asking is that ki your child is having chorea you know There is persistent chorea that is happening. So, how will you have rigidity along with chorea in the same child at the same point of time? And sir is hinting that possibly you had variable tone that was there. So, can you explain that there is rigidity and then there is a dance-like flowing movement also happening at the same point of time? Tone is coming. tone will be tone is variable actually when there is chorea there will be hypotonia when the, the when there is no chorea the tone will be increased so uh, when you were stimulating an examination the child didn't had coriform movement at that point of time you want to say this when on when and the tone could have been variable uh, because of possibly of possibly there there was some error in judgment uh, maybe at once you felt that there was rigidity that possibly sir is very right to say that was there was a variable there must have been a variable tone you know whenever you have these extra pyramidal possibilities you are more of a excitatory hyperactive hyperkinetic movement disorders then the tone is mostly variable if you have hypokinetic extra pyramidal affection most of the time then you will have this rigidity you know okay proceed proceed i'll, I'll comment once your examination is completely over my best observed power was 3 by 5 reflexes superficial reflexes conjunctival reflex present palatal and gag reflex present abdominal reflex present bilateral plantar flexor deep tendon reflexes jaw jerk absent biceps triceps and supinator was normal uh, and the knee jerk was uh, normal and ankle jerk was normal in both sides sensory system examination only pain response was eliciteable and was present cortical sensation uh, could not be elicited cerebellar signs not eliciteable gait could not be assessed spine and cranium normal bowel and bladder incontinent there is no meningeal signs other system examination cardiovascular system s1 s2 heard no murmur respiratory system bilateral arrhythmia present no rx sounds per abdomen there is soft and no organomegaly thank okay. summary uh, okay uh, can we get back to your examination first slide okay 
no 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 don't okay chalo let us start from here only so general exam general physical examination you have covered i just wanted to know what do you want to look for with peripheral nerve thickening just for completion sake it was asked sir and it is also seen in refsum's uh it's a kind of neurodegenerative disorder to rule up that so you see this in leprosy you see in when you leprosy. have demyelinating neuropathy which is not a differential here so sometimes some one can argue there would be a difference of opinion on that ki how much we should say just for the sake of completion if something is not completely irrelevant in a specific context i would may i might consider that you might don't i will consider that you might not be understanding the case and that is why you are bring up the issue so in that scenario maybe it is not required um, but again there would be a difference of opinion i agree on that okay next slide so uh, whenever you talk about anthropometry you should always say what is your interpretation of this So, what do you interpret from your anthropometry? There is wasting, there is stunting, there is both, there is none. What is your interpretation? Severe, severe underweight. So, so that that should be also mentioned with your anthropometry. Next slide. Okay, okay, vitals. So, and one more thing: in an eleven-year-old, taking a head circumference will not mean much, you know. So, especially if the development was normal. So then maybe you can avoid taking an head circumference in more than five years old if the development is preserved. Vital is all okay. Next. So this also you have covered. You have covered uh, everything. I am happy that you have mentioned the abnormal movements in your head to toe examination itself. So one very important thing for us as an uh, MD exam going or a PGs. is that if something is very glaringly present don't wait to mention it to your exam the examiner is always waiting to listen to that so it is maybe even if you bring it to the first sentence of yours when you are talking about the decubitus that the child was lying supine they also must the coriform was movements must be continuing so you should say there itself that there is some abnormal flinging movement which is appears to be coriform the details i will mention in the neurological examination but the examiner should understand ki okay you have noticed that it's not that it has uh, you it has, you have not paid attention to it okay come to the neurological examination so the higher mental function so what is your interpretation of this so uh, cortex is involved so memory speech language and uh, consciousness oriented was a uh, the child is conscious or unconscious it's conscious but uh, not able to orient uh, so the consciousness has two things it is has to he has to be awake and has to be alert so you see that the child is awake but is not alert to the surroundings so that can be specifically brought in and once and then to substantiate that you can also add on that there is no understanding of single one step commands okay open show your teeth close your eyes so these are one step commands okay so even that is not and is not interested in even interactive with the mother or the family members so this gives you a picture okay the higher mental the child is in some sort of an encephalopathic state can we use gcs here glasgow coma scale This is more for trauma. So, alter sensory only we have to. So, is coma, is it only for trauma? Also, coma, coma patients only we have to interpret GCS. Come again. No, my coma. state. My question is that whether GCS should be used to discuss the tell about the consciousness level of this child or not. No, if sir, yes, then why you have not mentioned, and if no, then why you don't think it is to be used? GCS is mainly for trauma-associated encephalopathy, so we. So you don't mm -hmm. use it in encephalitis. We can. Use you don't use in TBM. How do you grade TBM, encephalitis, 
all those are the graded based on the GCSE score, isn't it? Only so in can coma, we... coma patients we have to interpret GCSE. So that do you be... can you use that in this or not? And the reason there is a behavioral disturbance. Uh, we can't assess the GCS properly. Okay, so I agree that GCS is should not be used here, but I'm not getting the right answers from you. So GCS is a assessment tool for acute onset encephalopathy. So if you have behavior issues, or these are not contraindications. If there is acute onset in keflopathy, you would do that. But here it is a subacute or chronic process which has been going on over weeks. So this in this child, GCS is not going to help you in any way. So that is why you are not using GCS here. Okay. The other points you have been able to cover, but if you have such a child, then at times when the child is more than seven years, you can try using mini mental state examination. So in an 11 year old child, you can do it. But as an MD, if you have not done it, uh, there is no major wrongs that you have committed. It is okay. Okay, so the speech and language you have talked about, the memory you have could not be assessed. Why the memory could not be assessed? The child was not able to indicate anything. Not, and all not these. Oriented. And, and all these upper four lines are the marker of the fifth thing that you have assessed, the higher cognition. What do you mean by that? Could not be assessed. Alertness, wakefulness, these are all markers of your consciousness. No. So you have already assessed that. So why do you say that higher cognition cannot be assessed? So you, if you, maybe you wanted to say a formal assessment could not be done. But then this is your interpretation that my child is awake but is not alert, is confused or disoriented in time, place and person. This is an assessment of your higher mental function only. So you don't have to say that it could not be assessed. Okay. So your higher mental function suggests this interpretation. Go to the next slide. Okay, so this this already sir has asked that uh, menace is by two and five. So um, it's fair enough. You have covered the cranial nerves. Next slide. So the motor system again. So this does what is the interpretation of this bulb? Is there any asymmetry or not? No asymmetry. Sir. Okay. Go ahead. Next. Again, so this we have already discussed. So in brief, can you tell me what is, how do you differentiate rigidity and spasticity? If we take that, okay, this child had got increased tone. So spasticity is velocity dependent. Rigidity is velocity independent. Spasticity involving only anti-gravity muscles and rigidity involved both uh, flexors and extensors. Uh, spasticity is a pyramidal, due to pyramidal injury. Uh, rigidity is due to extra pyramidal. Yep. Spasticity is a class knife. Uh, rigidity is lead pipe and cogwheel rigidity. Uh, reflexes will have, be exaggerated in uh, spastic. You have spastic. other pyramidal signs with spasticity which will not be there in rigidity as is the case here. No. So the other pyramidal signs are not there. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, so uh, it's okay. So what is your final assessment of your neurological examination? So um, it involves uh, extra pyramidal uh, What are the what are the next slides, doctor? Summary, summary. If I am a eleven year old developmentally normal child. Whose presence with uh, scholar uh, previous. previously normal child, previous uh, scholastic performance were fair, brought with complaints of seizures, choreoarthritis movements of all four limbs, predominantly left with behavioral disturbances, with sleep and speech disturbances, 
with uh, bowel and bladder control with increased tone no sensory uh, and cranial lobe involvement with the severe underweight it is a case of uh, subacute progressive encephalopathy involving the uh, extra peripheral symptoms probably cortex cortex and extra peripheral my differential diagnosis will be autoimmune encephalitis infectious encephalitis uh, acute demyelinating uh, encephalomyelitis sle Possible? Can I make a small comment on the examination done so far? Yes, yes, doctor. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it was neatly presented. Most of the points have been uh, put forth. Uh, just a few comments. I think this child was lying supine and was not ambulating. So on the anthropometry, we'd be uh, inclined to measure the length of the child and not the height. I think you mentioned it as height. So please be careful. Like whenever children uh, are lying down. and uh, non ambulant i don't think the child would have cooperated to stand and to measure the height and the involuntary movements uh, we were waiting to hear uh, the uh, we saw the video but again the exam case i think you need to describe the movements uh, in a better way like uh, quasi purposive involving which uh, uh, which group of muscles proximal distal left right um, i think uh, You, there was just a pass mention about the presence of choreothoracic movement and some more official dyskinesia two lines in your examination uh, this child predominantly had uh, eps extra peripheral symptoms so i think that part uh, could have been uh, uh, described in more detail uh, if more official dyskinesias then what 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 were the movements exactly so these are the two things and uh, there was a uh, discussion going on of, about gcs so uh for the benefit of other uh, students as well is there any other score that can be used in uh, in children presenting with acute onset of altered sensorium apart from gcs avpu okay avpu is a simplified thing alert verbal voice responsive pain and unresponsive anything else which can be more detailed similar to gcs we heard a four score F O U R, so it is a uh, full outline of unresponsiveness. So GCS again, uh, uh, it is not just for trauma. Any patient with acute onset altered sensorium or altered behavior, Glasgow Coma Scale, it it again is important at at the time of admission as well as uh, following up the child whether the there is improvement or not. And again, full outline uh, that four score is again a alternative. It again talks about the eye movements, the motor movements, the respiratory movements. and the brain stem reflexes uh, it will be a more detailed uh, uh, detailed analysis of the uh, consciousness level per se and again it is uh, been uh, increasingly used in children with acute onset of altered sensorium so gcs and four scale avpus are more simplified scale uh, these two are more detailed so these are the scales that can be used in acute onset altered sensorium this child had a baseline Uh, uh encephalopathy so this is more of a subacute uh, subacute process so possibly as rightly said gcs may not be able to bring out the uh, uh, disturbance here so otherwise these are the two skills that can be used doctor uh, professor ramachandran has suggested that you should include uh, in your head to foot examination like uh, thyroid the status of the thyroid as well as like a k ring like we have uh, missed out on the k ring okay doctor Chelsea. like uh, proceed doctor because we are running short of time can we proceed to the investigation sir please please go ahead bala please sir proceed sir. Balaji, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, I am there. Sir. Ah, start off. Sir, and uh, to to the roll over the probable differential diagnosis, we like to follow this investigation approach, sir. By starting with CBC, peripheral smear, CRP and ESR, RFT, LFT, serum electrolytes, serum calcium, 
blood culture and sensitivity urine albumin sugar and deposits manto cb nat csf analysis thyroid function test antigen reduction and antibody testings ct brain mri brain and eeg sir doctor like uh, in peripheral smear okay like when chorea is there uh, what uh, can give you a clue in the peripheral smear sometimes we can find any abnormality in the rbc acanthocytes can be can be seen sir acanthocytes what, what are acanthocytes like how do they look acanthocytes are speckled spike spike speckled rbcs uh, it can present in your acanthocytosis um, also we can doctor then uh, like for example you have uh, like uh, features of uh, hemolysis okay that is spirocytes with the polychromatophil yeah and uh, probably uh, like uh, then uh, what what would that suggest maybe it is like coombs uh, negative it can be measles sir Wilson sir Wilson sir Wilson's the Wilson's presence like one of the presentation of Wilson is like uh, Coombs negative acute hemolytic hemolytic isn't it so that can be the like. okay cs of analysis like uh, like uh, what could be there like and uh, you have given a lot of differentials isn't that like uh, um, cs analysis infectious uh, cause for hepatitis and uh, autoimmune encephalitis like what could be the cs of analysis like? in case of autoimmune encephalitis uh, in csf um, counts will be there will be moderate pleocytosis which is lymphocytic in predominance uh, there will be normal to moderately elevated protein carb proteins um we can also uh, we can uh, we can also find um, uh, in csf uh, antibodies to nmda receptors um uh, further in uh, in csf we can uh, look for a uh, hemo uh, ig ig immunoglobulins and all your other band, bands can be seen in case of autoimmune encephalitis sir okay doctor doctor professor ramachandran has CS of sugar sir is asking you regarding CS of sugar. Uh, CS CS of sugar uh, in case of uh, autoimmune encephalitis it will be normal sir. So among the three CS of sugar protein and cells sugar could actually differentiate between an infective and autoimmune process more than your cell counts and protein you know. Yes, Because lymphocytic predominance can be there in TBM so But the sugars would be markedly low in TBM. Here, the sugars would be more or less normal. So it is CSF sugar which is more important. And you have mentioned CB NAD. Doctor Ramachandran sir has asked. So continue, sir. Sir, please, sir, please continue. Professor Ramachandran sir has uh, mentioned like uh, that you have missed out on the ultrasound abdomen. Like, why do you do ultrasound abdomen? Since this it is case. a female child of around um, adolescent group, we can expect the uh, teratoma, sir, ovarian teratoma, or a um, partial partial ovaries, uh, which can present a certain means of disease. We have we have done that we have done that for the child, sir. And also hepatomegaly for Wilson's. But it has not been mentioned in the slide. Okay. More than TFT, like what else? Like I will suggest. Uh, uh, we can does, do. Uh, we can do anti-thyroid process antibodies, sir. Anti-TPO. Okay. Anti-thyroid globulin, sir. Regarding the antibodies, like which is the commonest uh, antibody found in children, like with autoimmune encephalitis? Um, commonest antibody is uh, anti-NMDA receptors. Uh, anti anti-NMDA receptor antibodies. Yeah. Uh, 
what is the like uh, eeg find eeg findings like uh, which you expect in autoimmune encephalitis uh, in, in autoimmune encephalitis are be uh, uh, generalized and focal uh, diffusion focal slowing sir uh, with uh, occasional epilepsy from discharges uh, we can uh, we can also find uh, a specific pattern called extreme delta brush which is present in around 30% of population in with autoimmune encephalitis sir. Dr. Prashant, Dr. Balaji. Um, okay, uh, Balaji and Shruti and others. Now tell me, now this child has come, you have your differentials in front of you. So which one investigation do you think will help you to rule out most of your differential? So which one investigation you would target? Yes, sir, for analysis, sir. In CSF, what are the things you will be doing? Um, cell count, then sugar, then protein, sir. Initially. And anti-NMDA panel. Then, then RAM strain. Then RAM strain. Okay. Uh, okay, but see, see and, and this going ahead straight away with an anti-NMDA panel, you already said you had kept this as a diagnosis of exclusion, isn't it? Sir. Yes, uh, we can uh, further move on with the, we can look for a, any infective pathologies like a presence of a, a HSV, HSV and so you, exactly so you will have to do an herpes DNA PCR you will have to do a CSF CB NAT to rule out tuberculosis and then based on your protein sugars and cell counts then you would take a call whether or not you want to go ahead with an autoimmune CSF autoimmune panel or not do you think MRI is going to help you in the four differentials that you have kept in ruling, excluding others? Yes, sir. MRI will definitely help. Sir. Uh, in case of uh, ADM, there will be diffuse multifocal involvement involving cerebral cortex, the subcortical areas, gray matter, and basal ganglia, everything at all. Um, in case of SL, uh, SLE, uh, we can find uh, MRI can show us. Um, uh, cortical atrophy with the uh, feature vasculitis like like that like that. Uh, in case of HSV, there will be um, uh, more more involvement, more uh, more specific involvement in medial temporal lobe uh, with the singlet gyrus and uh, frontal lobes, particularly of orbital surfaces. Uh, in case of autumn encephalitis, there will be unilateral um, bilateral um, uh, in, uh, the bilateral diffuse uh, involvement of missile temporal lobe, which is a characteristic finding, sir. So MRI will definitely help to uh, differentiate between these four things, sir. So, yes. So MRI would be one investigation by which you will be able to rule all these things. And then you can use your CF, CSF in a more targeted manner. So that is how you should be proceeding here. And again, now this child, we don't know. You already had one possibility of an XOL or a TBM. So, and but yes, on your examination, when there was no papillary edema, you could have gone ahead with a CSF before an MRI. But if there was more and ac more acute like presentation where some papillary edema or asymmetric neurological or focal neurological signs were there, then also MRI would be better to you should go ahead with an MRI first and then you plan and do a CSF. So CSF is an invasive investigation. You will not be able to repeat it many times, you know. And you cannot take a lot of sample just for the sake you might need it later for other investigation. So maybe that is one way by which you can proceed. And autoimmune encephalitis, actually it has no characteristic MRI findings. The other differential, however, will have, and you will be able to rule them out. Autoimmune may not have temporal lobe affection or maybe other, any other affection as well. So if you have a non-contributing non MRI, it doesn't go against your diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. You can you can proceed proceed further. This, the following investigations are done in done, done by ourselves, sir. Uh, based on investigation, CBC uh, uh, total count will be no, is normal uh, with the lymphocyte predominance of median percentage. Hemoglobin is nine point three. Hematocrit is twenty eight point seven. Platelets is uh, two lakh forty seven thousand. CRP is negative. ESR is forty seven millimeter per hour, slightly elevated. RFT urea is nineteen and creatinine is point five. 
um, movie and serum melatonin sodium is 141 potassium 416 urine albumin is nil and sugar is nil uh, blood culture no growth in covid covid rt pcr was negative serum jai was also negative serum ceruloplasmin is normal in range 77 mg per deciliter man2 is negative tft is normal the anti tpo antibodies are negative moving to csf panel proteins are 21 mg per deciliter which is normal sugar is 37 mg per deciliter cell count there will be a lymphocytic predominance of a, around 80 cells per millimeter cube uh, in csf ab aspas basically is not detected cb net is also negative j j is also negative and hsv pcr is negative sir what is um, your wait 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 go back to the previous slide so what is your interpretation of sugar 35 mg per dl what uh, should i make sugar, out or uh, someone should make out of this sugar is slightly in the um, uh, lower end sir how do uh, you say that what is the way to tell a, that whether csf sugar is low or it is normal uh, it, it has to be compared with the uh, cm um, uh, blood sugar level sir uh, so it should have be you mentioned the blood sugar level In the blood sugar these, these, these are important things we should not never do this we should always do a blood sugar before we insert the csf needle and then we should actually, uh, compare csf sugar in light of that actually okay. it is done sir it is done sir the blood sugar level is around say is 64 mg per deciliter sir okay 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 proceed we are already running out of time uh, our chest x-ray was normal mri brain is normal us abdomen is also normal a eeg shows background activity is low for the age with intermittent epileptic form discharges suggest you have mild cerebral dysfunction and epileptic form activity there is no extreme delta brush no periodic lateralizing epileptic form discharges 7 to 8 hertz theta to alpha waves in background activity sir uh, csf water wind panel uh, anti nmd anti glutamate receptor anti nmd antibodies are positive other other than that uh, anti amp amp antibodies gaba b um, lgi1 caspar and dpbx are all negative for this trial sir um the child was a managed with anti epileptics started on methyl prednisolone at 30 mg per kg for 5 days the followed by oral maintenance of steroids uh, uh, ivg was given at, uh, uh, at 2 g per kg over 2 days sir um after 20 days of hospitalization now the child is able to recognize her parents able to walk without support able to obey simple commands able to play with toys still bubble and bladder can not attain and the uh, child is not able to speak sir கைய <laughs> தூக்கு <laughs> <laughs> கைய தூக்கு ரெண்டு கைய தூக்கு மேல தூக்கு இந்த கையா அந்த கைய தூக்கு நாக்க so it was gratifying to see this video the child has improved so much so uh, so so now now can you so now do you want to tell me that autoimmune encephalitis is always a diagnosis of exclusion in pediatrics or you can think on autoimmune encephalitis if you have certain things in your clinical history and examination so abrupt onset cognitive slowing delusion slipping hey sir child present the new uh, sudden onset neuro psychiatric symptoms autoimmune encephalitis should come in our mind not as a last last diagnosis it has to come in our mind as first one sir we need to think about that sir okay so ju- just to add it to that what you said we we think we strongly think of autoimmune encephalitis whenever we have 
a settled back pattern. There is a febrile illness, the child recovered, and then there is a neurological syndrome which is appearing. And if that syndrome is more like a neuropsychiatric disorder with extra pyramidal movements. So these two things are quite classical there of suggest which suggest an autoimmune process. And even Sorry, Balaji, please uh, mute your uh, cell phone, Balaji. I think your device is on. Even in, yeah, please. Even, sorry, it's okay, okay sir. So in, in this extra pyramidal movement, also that perioral dyskinesia is quite a hallmark of autoimmune encephalitis and NMD encephalitis rather. So if you have these perioral dyskinesias, these behavioral issues, cognitive decline with or without seizures in a subacute manner, it is quite classical. So, Palaji, can you tell me ki how frequent this autoimmune encephalitis is these days? So, what is this? Is a rare syndrome or is it a common syndrome? What is your opinion? Autoimmune encephalitis happens for around forty. So, compared to an infective encephalitis, what is your take? Around forty percent of uh, autoimmune encephalitis, forty uh, percent of encephalitis account for autoimmune encephalitis. So yes. So these days now this autoimmune, the more we are knowing, these become these are become quite common. So abhi currently one third is infective, one third is autoimmune, and in one third still we don't know what the etiology is. But may, a a big chunk of even that could be some sort of an autoimmune encephalitis. Only. So this is how, and and there are some Western data that suggest that it is actually the most common cause of encephalitis, even more common than herpes encephalitis. There is a encephalitis California encephalitis project, which the data that from there is suggest that even this is even more common than herpes encephalitis. So this is something very common. We all have to know the clinical settings in which you have to consider, and so so the, these three things that I said. A subacute onset, neuropsychiatric, extra pyramidal movements. You should always consider extra uh, autoimmune encephalitis as your first difference. Can I just add a point? Yes, yes, yeah. doctor. Yeah. Like... yeah, yeah, well presented. Uh, so. We have to recognize the clinical syndrome. So one is this group of syndromes where uh, subacute onset of uh, maybe seizures, orofacial movements, movement disorders. The other common group of conditions where again autoimmune etiology has been increasingly recognized is the ADAM type of presentation. So where anti-MOG antibodies, the myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. So that is again increasingly recognized. So these are some of the very typical presentations. The anti uh, uh, NMD receptor antibody mediated encephalitis and then anti-MOG where you have uh, uh, ADEM or sometimes called as longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis or the optic curator. So these are all, uh, these are two syndromes are very, uh, very well described. And uh, one more thing about autoimmune processes is that uh, uh, a few disorders have characteristic autoantibodies detected. Like for example, in uh, NMDA, we have these NMDA receptor in CSF. Again, in MOG, uh, the serum is more sensitive. The serum MOG antibodies can be detected. Uh, serum Sending serum sample is uh, more appropriate in that setting. Uh, in certain other situations, especially in uh, something like thyroiditis, we have generalized autoimmunity uh, rather than a specific autoantibody. So you may have non-specifically elevated autoantibodies like anti-TPO or anything, but they may not be pathognomonic or they may not be the exact uh, pathogenic uh, uh, causal association may not be there. So, like more and more uh, uh, literature is coming up regarding these autoantibodies and how they are interplaying with the cell surface receptor neurons. Some are intracellular uh, receptor uh, mediated antibodies. So, I think it is it is all in evolution. So, uh, uh, as told, rather than a diagnosis of exclusion, we have to uh, make all efforts to like uh, uh, find out an etiology because treatment, early treatment, early recognition, all these things improve the outcomes in these patients. Like uh, you uh, you wait till the patient develops cognitive decline, vis-a-vis -vis 
you identify it early and then treat early the outcomes are obviously much much better yeah So, anything further to be added, sir, from the judges? Amachandran, sir, Srini Vasan, sir, like. Yeah, actually, similar cases, you know, three children I had seen in Jipmer over the last five years. Sir, sorry, uh, Dr. Sruti, please uh, switch off your uh, slide. Yeah. Yeah, stop your slide. Exactly, slider. similar uh, abnormal movements. Similar three girls of uh, no prepubertal and pubertal age responded well and proved to be an MDA receptor at anti encephalitis. Yeah. So that was uh, this thing and very well discussed. Johari, brilliant. And Namula, of course, Balaji, I have heard. So excellent presentation, excellent uh, discussion. So this today I learned about four score. Otherwise, I was not knowing. I asked Ram Chandran. Then I thank you so much. Dr. Prasad, you want to add any points now? We have, we have covered almost everything. So I, I would agree with what uh, Balaji said. Ki this is something which is actually evolving. From 2004 onwards, we are detecting this autoimmune encephalitis in children. And But these are actually, the good part is that this is treatable. So we should not waste time and many a times before we get the results of these autoimmune panels, we have to make a decision whether to treat with steroids or not. So there you need to rule out infection. So your understanding of the regional infections, it is also very relevant. So one should be very sure that the infections are ruled out to whatever possibility your MRI is going to help us and then we treat. Now the treatment again, sir, as, as we have given in this child, both IVIG and steroids. So sometimes there would be financial constraints and all other issues also. So again, we are not very sure that this has to be done in every child. But if you have a significant presentation, then this is what people have suggested is the best way to hit hard at the first go itself. And if there is not there is no response, then maybe you can consider other modalities like rituximab or plasma pheresis if the availability is there. The outcome is generally good, sir. 70 to 80 percent of NMD encephalitis will completely resolve. Under 20 percent might have some residual cognitive or learning disabilities. But otherwise, compared to acute viral encephalitis where we don't have much symptomatic direct therapy, this one entity is very amenable to treatment and has to be recognized. So this is what I would like yeah, to Dr. Prasad, uh, do you have any data regarding autoimmune encephalitis in the AIMS in the, uh, the past one year? Sir, like we, sir we, we, have, we have in fact a, a big uh, series of us. One we have already uh, uh, submitted for publication a few uh, years back and then we are compiling another. So what we see is that Key NMDA, apart from NMDA, we have anti MOG associated encephalitis, as uh, Dr. Balaji said. Key, uh, even in autoimmune encephalitis like presentation where you don't have ADEM, there also is sometimes anti MOG is getting positive. And then right. serum is the right way of getting to that diagnosis. And then GAD, anti GAD, anti GABA, these are these three, four are common ones. But yes, anti NMD is far more common than all these. So we need to be very sure that we are not. Doing. I think your neurology society should uh, have a registry to uh, have uh, multicentric uh, data. So that would uh, yes, be very sir. useful because you know it's high time, uh, just like celiac disease, you should try to analyze data and try to find out. Yeah, Definitely, sir. This, that is a very good idea. In fact, what we are seeing these days, no, key, almost a third of the neurological disorders are all actually autoimmune in nature. And this, when you bring up autoimmunity, you bring up some treatment modality also into the picture. So this is one good thing, sir. PGI also has got a data and then maybe we can all sit together and uh, collate. Yeah, things. you can uh, start to initiate the movement. Yes, definitely, okay. sir. Definitely. We'll take there your advice, sir.
Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Murlai, do you have any data regarding uh, autoimmune encephalitis you are managing now? So I think you have published uh, quite few, uh, two or three publications, I think. So the acid, like uh, we are, the problem is uh, thinking about these only. I think uh, last, at least 10 years, probably 10 years back, we might not have been thinking about the autoimmune etiologies. Now, at least past 10 to 15 years, I think uh, we are thinking. And uh, uh, again, sending sample both serum and CSF uh, doing together sometimes because uh, antibodies may be detected uh, in high titers in one uh, like serum or CSF based upon the antibodies that we are looking at. And uh, outcomes are generally very good. Like so some 80, I mean, 80 to 90 percentage of them have a really good outcomes. Uh, uh, and uh, stepping up therapy is also something that is important. So if they don't respond to one particular group of treatment, probably stepping up uh, to the other uh, modality obviously helps. And uh, uh, I just had one small question. This aut antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis is something that people are uh, obviously is talking oh, actually about. Actually, a lot of antibodies are coming. So one by one, almost now more than 10 are there, uh, autoimmune encephalitis. <laughs> so I think <laughs> with uh, more uh, understanding, you'll get more. Am I correct, Dr. Jauri? Yeah, exactly. Initially, sir. it was only uh, NMDA, but now we have find, uh, no, found so actually, many. Actually, sir, every year you will see one more antibody getting added. So every year we are getting one more. So currently what we have is a seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. It is actually, to some extent, the clinical acumen has to go in how much empirical you want to be. So you have to be, uh, that is very valid thing, in fact, Dr. Bala, that you have raised that. Okay, if it is seronegative for currently, but then how strongly you are ruling out other differentials and then you are going ahead with your immunosuppression because that can be detrimental if you are treating a malignancy with that or you're treating an infective etiology with that. And sometimes we have also learned with our experience that there were a few cases with um, neurometabolic disorders that initially showed some response to steroids and then later again the child worsened and uh, we got a GCMS done and then we identified that there was a methyl malonic acidemia. We had two such children as well. And they were being, initially the treatment was started with a seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. So all these things, are, so what we do, are, what I tell my DM residents is that if we have a seronegative autoimmune encephalitis and we have virtually with some confidence ruled out an infective etiology, go ahead with your first methylprednisolone and IVIG pulses. And if you see that the response is not very much or there is a relapse which, is, uh, which has happened, then at that point, do reevaluate the child for other possibilities. That should include your neurometabolic disorders. And then after you receive a negative report, then you intensify your further pulses. So, and uh, we'll gain, we gain much and more confidence the more patients we see. But this is what currently we are following here at AIMS. So many attempts we have to resort to rituximab and- uh, Regarding the protocol, sir, Sir, regarding the protocol to be followed uh, uh, for continuation phase of steroids, like uh, what is the protocol which is being followed there, sir? Like continuous or pulsed uh, steroids for how long, sir? sir we, we give a methylprednisolone pulse with 30 mg per kg for five days and then six weeks of uh, prednisolone at 2 mg per kg and then six weeks of tapering. So this is what we do. Now, there are certain scenarios like if we detect an anti- Aquaporin-4 antibody associated, most like it will be presenting like LETM, long, longitudinal extensive transverse myelitis. So if such a thing is there, then we prolong steroids and we switch over with a oral immunosuppression. But only if acute encephalitis is there, autoimmune encephalitis is there, then we give this six plus six weeks of oral steroids after pulsing. And with pulse, we tend to we actually combine it with IVIG also in majority, unless until the presentation is quite mild and we don't want to use both. This is how, and by four weeks, we reassess the child. If we see that we are not getting any benefits from that, then based upon the clinical scenario and others, we take a call of giving a repeat course or continuing towards plasmapheresis or rituximab. So these days we are more inclined towards 
giving rituximab if there is no response to our first cycle of therapy. And if that also fails or, or, or there are other reasons, then maybe we take this help of plasma pheresis at that point of time. Recently, I read in uh, Pediatric Things of North America, February 2017 issue, uh, no unusual diseases and then uh, autoimmune encephalitis neurological states have been described. Of course, after that, a few uh, this thing, review articles have come in child neurology and the pediatric neurology. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so I think in case any of you are interested, you can see that article. I read it somewhere uh, about uh, 10 days back. It is a very well written article. Of course, it contains other diseases also, which presents and then uh, it causes a uh, diagnostic problem. Thank you, sir. And now I request uh, Dr. Uh, Ramachandran, sir, to come in. Yeah. So, first of all, let me congratulate the postgraduates. There are a lot of Sri's there. Uh, Sri Suti, Sri Balaji. I don't know whether other girl is also Sri. I don't know. Okay. And uh, so we had a very interesting presentation and uh, a lot of uh, quick fire answers also. So it's very, very good to see that the postgraduates are working hard. They are trying to make an impression. They are trying to make a good diagnosis. Okay. And uh, I think they are uh, going in the right track, the clinical examination also. They are uh, highlighting the good points. So uh, this is, uh, we are not, uh, though we are uh, constrained and not having the cases, we are really benefiting from uh, the postgraduates from uh, all over the state. So congratulations to postgraduates and their mentors first. And then to the, our uh, experts today, uh, Dr. Uh, Johari. So we are, uh, Fortunate to learn uh, the updates in uh, neurology, especially autoimmune uh, problem. Plus, the way you are given the approach uh, guidance to the postgraduates, that is more important for the MD postgraduates because uh, basic, the basic things have to be very good, very strong, their approach. So, that is the point you have emphasized in your uh, discussion and analysis. So, that is one thing the PGs will have to always remember the clinical approach, how you discuss is what is going to carry you through. We are very fortunate to have now all go to the, to the genetic or molecular diagnosis nowadays to confirm your clinical diagnosis. So this is very fortunate nowadays. Four decades back, we would have diagnosed only TB meningitis. Then probably we would have diagnosed this such a case, herpes meningitis or gone some neurologic psychiatric problem. Now we are able to give a relief to the child. So this is the... The beauty of the evolution of medicine, we are learning both clinical medicine as well as the molecular level. So we are, we are really happy and uh, fortunate to see good outcome in this child due to the efforts of the department and the postgraduates. So congratulations again to all of you. And uh, sir is always uh, there at Srinivasan to give us good practical points. And thanks, sir. Uh, IAPT NST for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I request Dr. Elirasi, madam, please. Uh, it was a wonderful experience and the PGs were uh, excellent in their the mentors and obviously the classes, Dr. Prashant sir, Ullai and Selvakumar, uh, Prashant sir, I mean you took a nice neurology class not only for the PGs, for all of us. Uh, the only thing I would like to add is we are seeing a lot of autoimmune encephalitis in the COVID and most of the children are also COVID antibodies positive. So from the last one year, we have seen an increase. I will definitely come to know because, uh, you know, when we have the huge burden of supplying uh, IV, IG. Okay, so I know. And we had a child who received few children, methylprep, then IV, IG, and then rituximab. And we had two children who improved very well except for aphasia, for which after adding cyclophosphamide, but the whole course to call more a year. So we don't know whether COVID is also increased in the incidence. I would welcome Sir Prashant Sir and others whether you people have seen so many. And of course, our neurology madam, I'm sure she will be publishing this because we've got lots of all these cases in the COVID, post-COVID. So that is one observation from my side. And if anybody has got anything, it's welcome. Uh, it was a IAP. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. All the young PGs, they seem to be really working. And all the good drilling by the team, it was a very interesting session. Thank you. And anybody seeing too much of cases increase, I think that would be one thing which I would like to know. Yeah, one point I want to again stress, uh, no, as mentioned in the investigation, 
ultrasound for the ovaries and uh, this thing. So kindly, when you suspect, kindly look for it in a female child. Uh, again, th thanks, Mullai, for uh, bringing out the four scores and uh, also very practical points. Okay, so you are uh, emphasizing on uh, the importance of thinking about SLE and other things. So thank you. So you are an intensivist. Now you have come down to the our level of uh, MD pediatrics. <laughs> teaches all clinical important points. <laughs> thank you so much. Dr. Prasad, I think you want to add any points? I think Madam has asked question. Uh, yes, uh, ma'am. Ma'am, you have a very uh, keen observation that you have made. So you know this autoimmune encephalitis has an infective trigger. That is how it triggers. So possibly there is some relation to with COVID. Uh, yes. are, Please put uh, one of your device. So, so we don't yes. know till now, ma'am. We are all learning. But yes, yes it, it has got affection it is neurotropic it has got neurological sign and symptoms but a part of it is because of the cytochrome surge so this this can very well lead to this but we don't have a direct causal relationship the other thing is that ma'am ki now actually 60 percent here at delhi almost 60 70 percent people are seropositive so when the prevalence is so high it is very difficult to say ki there is a causal relationship between these two entities but yes, oh, in fact, over a few years, we have seen autoimmune encephalitis is on a high. Uh, we might have a referral bias. So therefore, uh, it will be difficult to say from our experience whether this has increased or not. But yes, we have seen that these cases are coming more than what previously was. But uh, it is the increased heightened seroprevalence that is leading to it. But yes, there are studies that say ki there is some sort of a cytochrome storm related thing and the trigger is a covid vax uh, infection and then you have an autoimmune encephalitis trigger some we actually ma'am we, we saw one child with which had both gat 65 and an mda positive post covid but the clinically the child was very mild and we actually then considered that possible there was some cross reactivity which is happening we are getting some uh, false positive reports as well. These, The same you would notice for SSP that has also increased these days. We don't know for what reason. That is also a, some sort of a, a, a mutant virus related, a slow virus disease, why that has also increased. So these things are there, ma'am. Maybe we'll get more answers later. Yeah. I mean, yes, yes. Observation now. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. Now, Dr. Janani, madam, it's one of the judge uh, from KKCT. Dr. Janani? She's not there. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Final comments, Dr. Stella uh, from uh, Punjab. So, uh, thanks a lot, sir, like for the opportunity given. I hope uh, my postgraduates uh, did justice to the presentation. I wonderful, thank you, sir. wonderful. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. I thank uh, Dr. Prashant and uh, Dr. Mulai Balaji for the excellent uh, deliberations. Like, uh, I learned a lot. Uh, during this uh, two hours, I also thank all the judges like for all the inputs they gave, and uh, like uh, it always motivates uh, me to see like uh, all the senior uh, um, like uh, pediatricians like uh, enthusiastically pa participating in all the uh, webinars. Like th I also thank Dr. Rajendran and the IAP team uh, for the opportunity given. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Salokumar. On behalf of IAPT NSI, I thank uh, Dr. Salokumar, a chairperson, and uh, his uh, postgraduates, Dr. Suruti and um, Rohini Ro Ro and uh, Sri Balaji. And uh, they've done excellent work. And I thank uh, uh, Dio from uh, PJ Chandigarh. Both are, I think, Dr. Mullai and uh, Silas Prasant, they've done uh, DM there. And uh, they're excellent uh, deliberation, I think. That uh, from capital to um, Tamil Nadu, I think the dissemination of knowledge is uh, extended today. I think uh, really I'm happy that uh, Prasand and as well as Mulai participated in an excellent discussion. And uh, really on behalf of IAPT and I really thankful to, uh, to Dr. Prasand and uh, particularly for his excellent uh, case discussion. And uh, again, I thank uh, today's uh, judges, uh, Dr. Sinivasan and as well as uh, uh, Director um, ICH, uh, Dr. Illerasi, Madam, Dr. Um, PRC, P. Ramchandra, sir, from uh, Sir Ramchandra Medical College team, and as well as the General Madam, and uh, was participated and uh, uh, 
had uh, given their valuable comments. Uh, thank you, Ananda. Thank you.